Hello, everybody. This is David Rovix with another episode of Fifth Estate Live, which comes to you every Tuesday or so, many Tuesdays at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can find these shows all archived in both video and audio form at fifthestate.org. And today I'm very happy to have as a guest Wayne Wayne Kramer, founder of the MC5, author of a fantastic memoir, founder of Jail Guitar Doors USA, and uh, and we're just going to bring him right on the screen. And uh, it's great to have you on the show, Wayne. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Usually, uh, you know, in the past, uh, TV and broadcast facilities have armed guards to keep people like me away from them. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, doesn't work as well on the internet, I suppose. The armed guards are a little less effective. Huh? Yes, yes, it's much better. When you were um, in in the in the '60s, at some point, you, you're, uh, the MC5 practiced in the fifth in the same building as the fifth estate offices, right? So that's that's kind of like uh, one one of the many connections there to the to the and, fifth estate. But. And we lived upstairs. You know, what, <laughs> we used to rehearse in the basement. And then um, John Sinclair and his people found another building a couple blocks away that they moved into, and the MC5 moved upstairs. That's fantastic. You know, one of the things that um, that I just, I mean, that really strikes me reading about your, you know, writing about the what what the MC5 was, what, the atmosphere that was going on around the band and everything that was happening at that time in the '60s, particularly that fusion of activism and music that was this powerful formula that seemed to be like one that you and the band and John Sinclair were just kind of like really uh, that, representing that kind of, uh, it's a long standing concept, but, it, but that was such a big part of the time. It seemed like, and, and you were, and what you were, and what you were doing specifically. And I wonder if you could just, Try, try to kind of bring us in there a little bit uh, as far as that, what was that nexus going on there between music and, and organizing? Uh, I, it's my sense that in those days, in the late 60s, that there was a agreement amongst all people of my generation. <clears throat> I mean, I'm 73 now, so you know, when we were all 19, 20 years old, 25 was considered old, uh, <clears throat> that um, that we all, that all young people stood in opposition to what the government of our country uh, represented. You know, we identified deeply with um, the aspirational um, language Uh, in the Constitution, that we all had equal justice, that we had equal rights, um, that everyone had access to the vote, that the people's voice was heard, and that the government were servants of the people. We believe that part, but the reality, um, the contradiction was more than we could bear, um, which, um, which automatically organized us. You know, when young men universally had to face conscription and be forced to fight in a war that we could not justify, we couldn't see where the enemy was or who our enemy was. It just didn't add up. It wasn't like our parents' generation. It wasn't World War II. There wasn't a Hitler um, or an attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, there was no attack on anybody. But the government said young men had to go serve and fight in a in a very deadly um, war, uh, and you know as th- these kinds of uh, heavy-handed tactics by the government automatically organized young people and certainly organized me. Uh, and and you know I don't think that I'm different than most people, and I don't think that the our band was different than our contemporaries. We all had to face, um, you know, these um, uh, oppressive, heavy-handed, um, and you know, sometimes deadly uh, uh, confrontations with uh, the authorities and the government. 
So that organized me. <laughs> and, and I think it organized many of us. I mean, you know, I think we all were in agreement. You know, we didn't like the way things were going and we needed to do something about it. We thought we had some better ideas. About how to do something about it and and, and how to, what kind of society you wanted to build. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, this, this, um, you know, when I think about the, um, I mean, when, when George was George Wallace, uh, who is the good Wallace? I can't remember which, there was Henry Wallace and George. Well, there, there was, was the one George who was Wallace, the comedian. Who was the guy who ran for president in 1948 under the socialist ticket? And Pete Seeger traveled with him and played music with him on the oh. whole tour. And and like this kind of like, you know, the, the politician and the musician traveling together, this whole kind of phenomenon was kind of like, I mean, it has this back backdrop, this this history to it. But then in the 60s, I mean, and, and I think very much in, in your universe, it wasn't... Um, it was it was a all over the continent. I think it kind of started in San Francisco, as far as I understand, with this whole idea that all music should be free and all these festivals should be free. But I mean, this is something you encountered. I'm not I'm not you. I'm not, I don't know to what degree you were advocating it as a, as a young person, but you ran into it a lot. Like I, you write about that trip to England where you get to this festival and and then they've just declared, oh, it's actually there's no money in it. Nobody's paying. You're not being paid. Uh, it's a free festival now. And that kind of thing happened a lot. And, and I just, but, and, and then, but there's like, can we, I just, can you try to get into the heads of the, those people at that time and what they were thinking? Because it's, it's significant. It seems to me, it's not just like, it wasn't just a passing phase of, of like some like, you know, weird idea that just came and went. It was, there was meaning to that. Well, I, th I think it was not only, you know, <clears throat> here in America, but I think it was worldwide that all young people, um, shared these ideas, and one of them was a rejection of of the capitalist system, uh, just an outright rejection of it. You know that that, and you know it's it's in our language and the foundation of the White Panther Party that you know free everything for everybody, free health care, free food, free housing, and you know these are. Um, uh, idealistic, utopian ideas, but why not? I mean, you know, we're fighting for something. We might as well fight for something that we we call utopian for lack of a better descriptor. But we just, I think the, the sense was that that the system was not working for everybody. Uh, you know, not unlike today. <laughs> hmm, yeah. That, uh, you know, that wealthy people continue to get more wealthy, powerful people continue to get more powerful, uh, agencies get more power, and we just, the, the only way we could make any sense of it was just to reject it all, you know, to, to say, you know, we wanted a revolution and to start over, but it wasn't a revolution like revolutions in the past where uh, gorillas go and hide up in the mountains and then they come down and attack the power structure with the military tactics and weapons and then go hide up in the mountains and then chip away at, you know, like in Cuba or something. <clears throat> it wasn't that going to be that kind of revolution. It was going to be a revolution, uh, a peaceful revolution of ideas, that our ideas were stronger than their ideas and that we could prevail, um, you know, with hard work and, and commitment. And, and, you know, I think to, uh, to some degree, we, we succeeded. How, how, what do you mean by that? And in, in the succeeded part, I just, uh, I just want to explore that a little bit. Well, out of that, you know, certainly the, the rhetoric was over the top. And it was extreme. I mean, the white, you know, the White Panther Party program was, you know, um, uh, it it was pretty nuts. <laughs> and uh, but in the all three that point program was that the three point program was that the band or the White Panthers or both that had the three point program? Well, the three point program was the MC Five, and then it was expanded and 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 
you know, there was a, an attempt to sound more legitimate, you know, and, and we idolized the Black Panther Party and, you know, they had a 10 point program. So we had to have a 10 point program. And, you know, again, it was it was aspirational. Um, but out of all that silliness um, emerged some real social movements. I mean, today the president is talking about the environment. That was born in the 60s. I mean, the MC5 singer, Rob Tyner, one morning we were having some coffee and he said, Wayne, it's all about the environment. And I said, what's the environment? I'd never heard the term. And he started to explain it to me. That movement continues to this day and is a is a powerful force in um, in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think that in the post Watergate uh, period, there were uh, legislative reforms that that mattered. Um, they they've undone most of them now. But certainly, Trump un undid most of them. But um, <clears throat> you know, the the women's movement emerged out of the '60s. Certainly, the you know we ended the war in Vietnam. You know, the, it wasn't just young people uh, in the streets demonstrating. You know, guys like Daniel Ellsberg uh, took a big chance. You know, the the Berrigan brothers. Uh, and there, you know, these um, that other group of uh, citizens that broke into the FBI's office and yeah. found all those documents on the night of the big fight. What a brilliant timing that was, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's a lot of good um, emerged. A lot of sparks were lit in that era that have uh, that continue and, and are part of our culture today. Yeah, yeah. That's. You know, one of the things that uh, I mean, it's it also part of our culture today is this like uh, this, the, the uh, at different aspects of what we might call the circular firing squad of oh, uh, that, yeah. that uh, the left wing is, is very capable of maintaining over really. I mean, it's been a good like um, good run of about 180 years of, of a circular firing. I mean, you know, the left still manages to accomplish all sorts of things in lots of parts of the world. But the circular firing squad continues and you've had way more than your fair share of that. And I mean, it just sounds extremely I mean, really, when I think about, you know, being 20 years old and do, going through the things you went through at the age of 20, it just sounds like extremely just completely overwhelming to, to imagine dealing with the really massive political contradictions of the day. And you're in a, this band that, that is really kind of, uh, you know, really represents uh, the movement. And then you end up, you describe the situation in New York city and this confrontation with the motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. And, and it just is, I mean, I think, uh, you know, which is, you know, not to, you know, make any, judgment on anybody at the time and everybody's grown and changed since then but i wonder if you can just uh talk about that kind of atmosphere of uh of sort of i'm more left than you i'm more militant than you and how how that was to well be living through. yeah yeah i mean you know what's the first thing the revolution does when it gains power is it makes out its enemies list and starts executing it, its, you know, the counter revolutionaries. Um, their, their comrades. <laughs> yes. The people that helped them win the revolution. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, traditionally you're right. That's been the, the, you know, that's been that's been what happens, and it happened to us too. But you know, not in not in the uh, the uh, let's execute our enemies, but certainly let's let's um, attack them. And and uh, you know, it for me it was it was it was traumatic for me. You know, I'm trying. I believe in what I'm doing. I'm I got my band. I've got my community. We've got our ideas about things. We're out there carrying a message we're busting our asses and we have you know <clears throat> some uh marxist from columbia university ripping us up you know i'd go to an interview to talk about music and politics and get ripped to pieces and you know i i wasn't that well educated i didn't i wasn't i mean 
I read books, but I read Ian Fleming. <laughs> you know, I didn't read, uh, you know, Marxist theory. And um, man, it was <clears throat> it was tough. These interviewers were ripping you to pieces as they're supposedly trying to <laughs> interview you. I mean, they're not they're not so much asking questions as, as giving you a lecture. Or yeah, exactly. And and uh, I mean, you know, this didn't happen twenty four seven, but. You know, you go on, you go to New York to do some shows and somebody says, we've lined up some press for you. Okay, let's go do that. That's part of the job. And then you get torn to pieces. And 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 then, you know, the physical confrontations uh, as well. That that story about the, with the motherfuckers. And, you know, this happened uh, time and time again. I mean, you know, people would come up to us backstage and, and, uh, and start to press us, you know, start to want to brace me on my politics. And, you know, I'm thinking, dude, you know, we're on the same side here. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not getting rich doing this, you know. <laughs> but that's another interesting thing is that the, that dynamic of uh, those people in the movement who did, who were under the impression that bands like the MC5 were getting rich and uh, and wanted wanted a cut of it, right? And and you you kind of had that experience on on more. I've also heard from other bands of the period who who uh, had this experience of basically getting hit up for money in, in really pretty you know, guilt ridden kind of ways by, by, you know, movement people who were trying to fund some project. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there was, there was a condition that emerged where you weren't revolutionary enough for the revolution. And, yep. and you know, I've discussed this with my good friend Tom Morello and his band Rage Against the Machine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he deals with this all the time. Yeah. Well, no, but they don't really. <laughs> they never really got attacked like that. I mean, he was surprised to hear from me that, that um, you know, our own comrades would turn on us. Because, um, mm. you know, I, I don't think there's the degree of, of uh, passion uh, for for radical change today that there was in the 60s. And it's that passion that existed that actually sort of is really sort of a big part of why comrades were turning on each other, isn't it? I mean, people felt like it's this, this is the answer. And if we don't do it this way, we're fucked. And so I have to get everybody else on board. I mean, there was that kind of urgency. Yeah. And, and I, I discuss this in depth with Mark Rudd. Mark's a mm -hmm. dear friend and a, and a brother and a comrade. And his memoir is fantastic, actually, yeah. absolutely fantastic book. And, and you know, we both ended up, you know, like he, he told me that, the you know, they had gone to the, the Cubans with this idea of violent revolution. And the Cubans said, it's not going to work. Don't do it. And they went to Black Panthers and the Black Panthers said, no, man, we're going with free breakfasts, you know, something that actually works in the community or uh, the Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese said, no, do not attempt to use violence. It has to be a nonviolent social movement. Uh, and, and, you know, that passion that that our way is the only way we ended up doing the fbi's work for them by by discounting a legitimate anti-war movement a legitimate voting rights movement environment women's rights gay rights all of that we tended to diminish the efficacy of it by our crazy <laughs> you know, guns and guitars kind of, I mean, I, I've thought about this to some, in some depth. And when you're young, you have this, I had, maybe other people had it, uh, this sense of uh, I'm invincible and, and I am absolutely correct. And yeah. I understand everything and I know what I'm doing. And this is the way. And, you know, if the world would just do the what I say to do, well, everything will work out fine. And, um, you know, now it's 50 years later and I realize I don't know one, one iota of what I thought I knew. 
and uh, you know that there's a lot of different streams of thinking and ideas, and the, the future can unfold in a lot of different ways. Um, it's just it's something you know, young people are. It's it's their gift and their burden. <laughs> yeah. And you you talk about how in the Detroit uprising um, after that, and I think you talked about like two thousand buildings being burned to the ground, and all that that so many people being killed by the by the soldiers and the police, and yeah, and then um, the the in the aftermath of the uprising, um, gun gun culture really took off in terms of collecting guns, and and this was really pretty much a national phenomenon, and I wonder if um. I mean, how how much of that was also about like uh, you know left wingers wanting to protect themselves from the police and from the right, and how much of that was a broader sort of uh, phenomenon? Like, I mean, you know, because this is this thing that's happening now with uh, these days over the past year, it's becoming well, the past several years, it's becoming very very common for uh, AR-15s to be a regular feature at protests in Portland and other cities around the country on both sides. Yeah, it's it's um, this is it's tragic in in my opinion. Uh, you know that this uh, between the NRA and um, the political right, um, and the fact that there's uh, over three hundred million guns in our country. Um, you know that you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube now. Now these guns are everywhere and people are not going to give them up. Even if the government did mandate, um, you know, no automatic weapons, I, I doubt you could enforce it, uh, certainly without bloodshed. You know, the right, right wing fanatics, I mean, they're for real. They, you know, a lot of these guys are ex-military and police, as we saw at the, at the January 6th insurrection. Um, you know, these are serious people. And uh, so, yeah, the, the gun thing, I mean, I've, I've seen uh, photo spreads of, of uh, African-American people arming themselves. Well, they might as well. Everybody else is armed and they're, they, every, all the white guys got their camis and their, and their a AKs and their ARs. And so... Let all the let, let the black community, you know, and everybody else. I mean, you know, I'm. It, it this is troubling and discouraging. Um, you know, I have a little boy. He's he's about to be eight years old, and he's going to grow up in a different world than I did. I mean, you know, guns are ubiquitous, and and. It's not going to turn out well. It hasn't turned out well. Um, this concept that used to exist only in science fiction about berserkers, you know, people going out in the public and creating some atrocity is reality today. I mean, it's it's horrific. And um, I, I, I just, I, I don't see a solution. It, anywhere on the horizon <laughs> i don't have a solution no do you know that the berserker uh term um, comes from a, a a little sort of tribe in sweden and when they would go to war they would dress up in bear uh and bear costumes and and take psychedelic drugs and and then attack their enemies and that's there's a little village called a, something village of the berserk I've, i traveled around sweden with a swedish historian so i learned a lot of <laughs> <laughs> You know what your your experience with uh, that record label it was it Electro Atlantic and and then you're you're a young political artist asking uh, you know what do I do with these interviews and then they say um, uh, uh, just don't talk about politics and, I mean that 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 was an interesting response <laughs> like it's the disconnect yeah. there but I don't know how much the music industry has changed so but you I mean then you were at, at one point trying to be in a band uh, that had a black member and you were told by a, a record company executive oh, you can't do that like what do you think it's supposed to be? it's either a white band or a black band and i wonder uh, you know is it the, what the the history of the music industry wasn't necessarily a central you know feature of your memoir but i wonder if about the how much experience you've had with the sort of 
racist nature of the music industry and how that has how you've seen that playing out because i'm not sure how many how many lay people are aware of the institutional divisions and and sort of racism and class divide within the music industry of 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 that period in particular well you know it it's it reflects the culture in general i i mean you know yeah i had this band in detroit i i it was post mc5 and i was very excited about the band and my partner in the band was a great detroit artist melvin davis melvin you know played in the miracles a touring band and was a, a motown studio drummer and a great uh, songwriter and producer and still is um and we found that we worked together really well and we shared a lot of uh, ideas and and beliefs and we had a couple other guys in the band uh, bob schultz from jackson michigan and a young man named tim Schaaf, uh from detroit bass player and i loved the band and i thought this is the future you know it's we can combine this heavy rock that i bring and my political consciousness and my performance skills melvin brings his fantastic vocal abilities, songwriting, drumming, producing. Uh, Tim was a great bass player. Bob Schultz was a wonderful keyboard player and also an incredible vocalist and is still working up there in Jackson regularly singing in, in his bands. Um, and then to be told by my booking agent that well, you can't have a black guy in the band. I just found it infuriating. You know, this wasn't 1950 in, in Mississippi. This was Detroit in 1970 or 72. No, it was about 73. And, and uh, it, it just showed you that, um, you know, musicians are often uh, at the tip of the spear. You know, we're... When, when you're, you know, artists are, are, you have to observe the world around you. You know, a painter has to see, uh, a musician has to hear, a songwriter, especially the language, you have to participate in the world around you. And when you see things that aren't right and you can make a change, that's what uh, artists have done throughout history. I mean, when when Picasso painted Guernica, that that fucked everybody up. I mean, they didn't like that painting. Oh, you can't show that in a painting. That's war and you know body parts and. Um, but he wanted to that that hurt him to to know the horror of war, and he put it into his work. Um, at the time, I didn't think it was that big a deal. But but the world around me did, and you know um, I I think I've been proven right over and over again now. I mean you know the Doobie Brothers and then a thousand other groups after that that are mixed bands. Like you know, listen, me and Melvin are different. You know, and it's not just the colors of our skin. You know, he his culture is different. My culture is different. But we had enough together we we shared more than we had indifferent which allowed us to be partners to have great affection for each other and great tolerance and and uh, have a, a vigorous exchange of ideas um those are the things that matter um but you know that I, I think i think that that same racist consideration exists today in in the music business you know it the roles may have may be reversed now but it, it's still you know if it exists in the culture it exists in the world of music too and i mean that it's just not as overt i mean you can have you can have mixed race bands now and so that that's not yes. the issue anymore not a big deal right as it shouldn't be yeah just like mixed families or mixed sports teams or mixed schools or mixed hospitals, you know, like really 
What? Because what hell, my skin is a different color, that's a, <laughs> that's really a reason. It's astounding how, yeah. how long this is taking, right? When you, you were actually in prison when The Clash um, recorded a song that was essentially about you, right? Was was that, were, were, did, were you aware of it? At the, and it I'll just full, full uh, you know, admission here. I'm only halfway through your memoir. I only just found oh. out I was going to be interviewing you a few days ago. And I, I'm just loving the book, but I, I'm only up to, you just got arrested. And, ah. <laughs> and uh, not that I don't know anything else about what happened since then, but, but as far as the memoir goes, you know, the, the, the wonderful detail and, and your wonderful writing style. And you, you also read the book, the audio book version is, is you reading it, which is a fantastic delivery of, of, of the book as well, which is, uh, really hard to do actually it's a it's a real skill isn't it to to actually do a good job of reading an audiobook but um yeah it's a job i mean yeah. people, that, people that do it for a living and do it well it's a it's a real you know skill i i just sent back a book uh, i bought the um philip roth uh biography and I, I wrote Audible back and said, I, you know, I can't listen to this. This the guy that's narrating it. It's unintelligible. Oh no! He has a he's British, and he's just a, has a particularly strong British accent. Maybe it's British Scottish, and I couldn't tell what the hell is he saying. You know, <laughs> they gave me my money back too. So yeah, it's it's a it was tricky to sit in the studio every day and try to trying to find that balance between just reading the words and putting some life into it. Because if you put too much life into it, you burn people out. And if you don't put enough life into it, you burn people out. So yeah, and I preferred to do it myself because I prefer to hear the authors read their own work because the author knows um, the subtleties underneath the text. and. You know the word. The words could say one thing, but how you say them could change that completely. So much, right? Which is, I, I always figure that's the main problem with Twitter and Facebook is like you can't hear the tone of voice of what people are saying, and so everybody assumes they're getting yelled at because that's how they grew up. You know, for most of us, it's like David David Mamet. You know, tells tells actors, you know, just say the words, just say the words, and you know. It, it, he said an actor said, well, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, I want to bring the, the, the feeling, the meaning of it. And he said, that's like someone sticking their arm out the window of a 747 and flapping it to help the pilot fly the plane. Don't just say the words. That's all. You know, I did all the other work. So now you just have to say the word, say the right words, say the words as they're written down. Don't improvise. <laughs> But to answer your question, um, I did not know about The Clash. Um, I didn't even know that there was a band called The Clash or that they had written a song about uh, my misadventures in, uh, in uh, the legal world. Mm -hmm. I didn't find out till I, till I got home. This, uh, you know the, the the jail guitar doors um, project that that I guess I, I, Billy Bragg was involved with in England and and mm -hmm. then uh, you you were involved with starting up the U.S. chapter and uh, you know me and Peter Werby the you know, producer of the show and one of the Fifth Estate uh, Collective uh, members we we visit a federal prison our friend Marius Mason and mm -hmm. currently in Connecticut and yeah you know. Um, he has access to a guitar, I think, about once a week uh, and only during religious services. And, uh, you know, you write about how the differences between like local and federal and how I mean, it's just, you know, I, I never realized how extremely restrictive the situation is for federal prisoners, even if you're in general population. I mean, Marius was in, you know, a communications management unit for a while and where everything is, you know, one of those it's a whole different situation, but even in general population, they don't have access to musical instruments, but that's, that's not the case in, in a lot of, a lot of prisons, they have more access and you're involved, you're involved in all kinds of ways with, with uh, bringing instruments and, and workshops into prisons. And can you, can, uh, I, for, especially for anybody out there who might want to get involved with that kind of work, who I think is a particular large slice of, of the potential audience watching this conversation. Can you talk about that work and how other people might get involved with it? Sure. 
Um, well, uh, just just to, to start off on your remarks about the feds, um, the federal prison system um, shows us no love. Uh, I, I think we might have got, we got some guitars into the federal prison here at Terminal Island under the auspices of a religious group. <clears throat> but generally, um, they've been hostile to us. We've tried on numerous occasions at different facilities. And this all, it comes from the top. You know, if you've got an asshole at the top of the organization, then his assholeism filters down to everybody else. And their attitude um, has, as far as our experience has been, is, you know, don't call, don't show up. We are not interested. One one uh, prison warden in Texas told me, because um, I appealed his decision and I got him on the phone and he said, I said, but why? Why can't we come and, and deliver some instruments in your facility? And he said, oh, the community wouldn't accept it. The community. And community? I got off the phone with him, called the sheriff in that community and the sheriff said, you want to bring instruments into my jail? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that's great. Bring them <laughs> in Travis County where uh, in Austin, Texas. I, I went to the federal prison at Bastrop and the warden said, no, the community wouldn't allow, wouldn't agree with it. And I turn around and the sheriff in the same county says, yeah, let's do this. And, and in fact, that's where we launched our first in prison uh, workshop program in uh at the Travis County Correctional Complex 12 years ago. <clears throat> um, so what we do is, is pretty simple. We find people that work in corrections that are willing to use music and art um, to rehabilitate prisoners or more accurately, habilitate prisoners. Uh, it's, it, it's my experience that people in prison um, we're, we're never habilitated in the first place. Um, they never had someone tell them, man, that was a great idea you just came up with. You know, for people like me and you, if I don't see you for six months and then I say, hey, David, what are you up to? And what are you working on? And you've got this project and that project and this book and this film and, the, you know, most people in prison don't have that, that relationship with other people, you know, or right. if they do, it's negative. The, the things that they're discussing. So um, we found that trying to connect with people that live in prisons through art, in our case, music, but we are uh, coalition partners with other groups that use theater, that use uh, writing, that use painting, um, that use dance, sculpture, and all of our experiences are consistent that to help people change, they have to be inspired. There has to be an incentive and it has to be an internal incentive. There can be external incentives if, if they're substantial. For example, here in California, there's a program called um, Rack Points rehabilitation, accumulated credits, something like that. And if you you can run up your rack points, you get time off your sentence. You can you can only get those points by programming, you know, by joining a group like Jail Guitar Doors or an education group. So those are real incentives, but there's a deeper incentive that's that's down in people's souls. You know, you just just to um it's like education. Prisoners in California, for the most part, about half of them are functionally illiterate. It's hard enough to try to get a job out here in the world when you can read. If you can't read, you've got a problem. Um, so if you educate a prisoner and he still is of the criminal persuasion, um, you just have an educated criminal. So we had to go deeper. We have to find what is it inside of people. And we found that 
the, the transformative power of creativity uh, to, to task someone with telling me, telling the world your story. What's your story, you know? Can you write a song uh, to your mom? Mm. Can you write a song to your son? Can you write a song to yourself and talk about who you are and how you got here and you know who you are today? And in the process of writing that stuff down and then vocalizing it to your peers, um, they change. There's a change that happens. They start to see themselves differently. They're not just that worst thing that they did in their whole life, that moment that got them into prison. Um, they're not um, a bed space. They're not a crime. They're an artist. Mm -hmm. They're not a gangster. They're, they're an artist. In our workshops, um, we, uh, we have rules for the workshops and the workshops require that all prison politics stay out on the yard. And mm -hmm. here in California, prison politics is another word for racism. And the, the guards use race to pit groups against each other so that they can keep control of the situation. The, the smartest prisoners understand this. And in fact, here in California, we, we have a, a gang um, uh, nonviolent intervention where they, a, cease, a cessation of hostilities by the four heads of the four major gangs. This messed up the, the prison authorities because you know if they can keep everyone separated, then they stay on top of the thing. But when they couldn't keep them separated, now they've got, and the, these guys are winning in court. They're filing, um, they ended a long-term uh, solitary confinement in California. Mm. There, ha there has to be a path out of that. A in any event, um, in our workshops, we do not recognize gang affiliations. We don't uh, recognize racial barriers. We don't recognize class distinctions. We don't recognize sexual preference. We can talk about anybody and everybody, but we have to treat each other with dignity and respect. And the men and women and children that we work with in corrections love our workshops because they can come in this room and they can just be natural people. Just, mm -hmm. just a bunch of guys in a room kicking it. And they don't have to worry about keeping up their gangster front and you know their allegiances and their and what we found is that you know years long resentments start to melt away. I mean I, I had a guy one day come up and say, Hey Wayne, you know, man, that dude, you know. Over there, you know, I I didn't like him, man. I, I just I didn't like him, man. I'd see him on the yard, and I don't like that guy. But we worked on that song together, and you know, he's not so bad. I mean, he's all right. You know, what we discover is, say, we're writing that day on children. That the homeboy, and and the peckerwood, both want the same thing for their kids. You know. The, the African American gangster, and and uh, you know the Asian gangster, they both want the same thing for their kids. Yeah. We have so much more in common than we have in different, and by by tasking them with the creative process, giving them the tools to be creative, nudging them along gently. To, to get the thing done. I mean, usually we have about an hour and a half or two hours to work in a workshop. So to decide the theme, break up the groups into temporary working bands. You know, how many people in here are rappers? How many people in here are singers? How many people here play the guitar? How many play drums? How many play keyboard? All right, and then we'll, we'll put them all together in groups that they wouldn't normally associate with. Now we're gonna write a song. You guys go in that corner and start your song. You guys go in this corner and then we'll circle around, listen to what they're doing. If they get stuck on one chord for too long, it's, hey, try an F chord. You've been playing C for a hundred bars here. You know? And 
um, get it done. We all get back together at the end and they perform the songs for their fellows. And it's, it's a magical time because everybody gets the jokes, everybody gets the pain, everybody gets the commonalities, they support each other, they cheer. I have to tell them, don't sing along. Don't play along with the other group. Let them do their thing. You know, it's hard to contain them. They're they're into it. Oh, great. And it changes them. They start to see themselves as more than a, a crime or a bed space or a prison number. And, and it allows them to participate in a larger world than prison and crime. And, and to see themselves as something else and that, that their people can see them as more than just a crime. It, it's, a, it's a profound um, experience to share with these men and women and children. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And in conclusion, mm -hmm. you can help us. If you're a musician, you can write to us and we'll find a place to, to put you to work, um, especially if you're a songwriter. Um, and you can uh, make donations at jailguitardoors.org because funding, you know, working with adult felony offenders, it's tough. <laughs> you know, we're, we're fortunate to find some, some uh, progressive uh, companies that are, that are underwriting our work, uh, but we get a lot of support from just regular people. People send us 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. It makes a difference. Um, and so we need that help. I mean, we, we, uh, we're not printing money over here. And, uh, uh, so if you, can, if you can help us out with a cash donation, great. If you know a way to raise funds with a corporation, great, let me know. Write me at jailguitardoors.org. Um, I'll have a conversation with you. We'll we'll move forward. We'll put you to work. Excellent. That's great. Yeah, you'll be hearing from me and uh, hopefully some other folks. <laughs> uh, Wayne, when uh, one of the things I wanted to hit on was uh, the, the state of the music industry over the past fifty years, um, but <clears throat> like when you. Um, I mean, basically, you know, when I got started as a as a professional musician in the 90s, uh, the music industry was five times as big as it is now. And uh, and a big tech uh, was just getting started. And now, you know, big tech is, you know, several of the biggest corporations in the world are those those companies. And the big three music companies are no longer anywhere close to three of the biggest corporations in the world. And, and I just uh, I mean, it's been it's been a whole lot of different aspects of the whole all these developments that could be you know, talked about. But I just wonder what are your general feelings about as I mean, you're very much involved as a producer of other people people's records and all kinds of stuff. And you, so you're, you're, you've been in the thick of this whole uh, collapse of the industry and working throughout, <laughs> but uh, what's that been like? Oh man, it's been, it's been a roller coaster, you know, to see the, the enormous potential get wasted, get just, I, I liken it to Detroit and the auto industry, that the big three were, were you know, Im impervious and imperialist. <laughs> you know, they, they controlled auto manufacturing. And, you know, they built some good cars. The state of the art was pretty good for a while. Um, they they created the city of Detroit as a manufacturing center of the world, um, uh, un, but they were so um, imperious that they lost touch with what was going on in the street, in the world, with regular people. And when the Arabs decided to charge sixty dollars a gallon for oil as opposed to five dollars a gallon. Um, and and gasoline prices, you know, went through the roof. And Detroit is producing these cars that are getting 12 miles to the gallon. Um, as much as I love those cars, um, <laughs> the Japanese and the Koreans and and the Germans, uh, you know, can't, had better ideas. 
their engineering was way ahead of the game. And the, the big three blew the entire industry in their efforts to, to uh, crush the unions uh, by building plants in Kentucky or Tennessee where the UAW didn't have a power base. Um, uh, they they blew the whole in they blew it and it's the same in the record business that you know these guys controlled the production of music the music delivery system they had these big plastic discs which you could not bootleg mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you had to buy a record and everyone was happy to buy them I mean they were things they were cultural artifacts for us we all loved our record collections you know we were. We were kind of like, you know, yeah, my record collection is bigger than your record collection, <laughs> you know? but it was true. And, and, and they thought that, you know, they controlled everything and nobody could touch them. And then here come these kids with their computers and their, their chips and their, the internet, and they're talking to each other on these, these arcane systems and, and then there's this thing called Spotify, and then, and then, and all the record labels are all talking about getting people, sending people to jail. I mean, Hillary Rosen at the RIAA says, we want to see people going to jail. <laughs> really? <laughs> they were suing thousands of people a year for a while, right? For yeah. downloading music. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they blew the industry. They blew, you know, the, the cash cow. I mean, the, the record business grew exponentially for 30 years. Every year they made more money as they refined their promotional techniques, as the, as the touring system evolved and got more professional, as uh, marketing, got, marketing and distribution networks got more sophisticated and they made more money, you know, and, and this was to our benefit as musicians because, you know, a guy at a label could sign you and give you a budget to make a record and give you a budget to tour on and, you know, get your picture taken and buy some clothes. And and they'd make all the money back from record sales anyway. So yeah. I mean, it would all work out. Yeah. Yep. And then yep. that all fell apart. And then and then Spotify started their free tier in 2013. And I wonder if, I mean, I know this is getting really geeky here, but I did, did, did in your life in the music world, was was 2013 an especially uh, a significant year in good or bad ways? Or, or has anything big changed since Spotify started their free tier? And in, Because in, like for a lot of independent musicians, um, at least that was the year when my income completely collapsed. Like yeah. when my CD sales were cut in half overnight, virtually from one tour to the next. And, and that was Spotify started their free tier. I mean, I didn't realize it until like a, two years later, yeah. what happened. <laughs> Right, yeah. Get the license number of that truck. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly, right? I just got run over. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, royalty uh, statements, uh, you know, I, I, I get royalty statements for 67 cents. Really? For, you do? Yeah, for oh, I just yeah. got one for, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of downloads. You know, it's, it's, they, Listen, as you well know, uh, we need a new paradigm. There needs to be a way to figure out, you know, because um, the ISPs uh, are making more money than they than the world has ever seen. Uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon are creating wealth on a scale the world has never seen. And it's not trickling down. Um, you know, I, I had a crackpot theory for a while that all the ISPs had to do is put a 50 cent music charge on there, uh, you know, on your cable bill. Yeah. That would, we would all that be, would fit, right? We'd Actually, all be that's... fine. Yeah, my stepbrother's in a heavy metal band. He had that same idea back in, I don't know, early on in this whole process. And that would have been exactly, I mean, they could just tax the big tech companies for, for this. They're making the money from it. Yeah, they believe me, they're, they're, boy, they're making the money. They're making wealth, unheard of wealth, wealth that we've never seen 
in the history of the world. It's, and it, it doesn't even trickle down. I mean, I mean, I think this is especially a relevant point. I don't know, you know, how much you want to get into this, but you know, you the MC5 has several hundred thousand monthly listeners on Spotify. Putting uh, the MC5 is therefore within easily within the 0.1 percent of the most popular bands on the platform, and uh, you know, but this this doesn't even trickle down. I mean, you know, it, it, you would think that every member of the band should be like well off uh, at this point just from Spotify uh, revenue, but it's uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's not the case. <laughs> What's that? No, it's not. You'd think, you'd hope. Uh, I mean, not even not even to be wealthy, but just to be able to survive. Um, it would be nice, but and even that you're not even getting survival level kind of income from from that, no. which is that's astounding. I mean, this is this. I mean, I know they don't want people talking about how much they're making and how much they're not making and all that, but the fact that a band of that stature, uh, th that the members of that band are not at least all making a, a fine living from having several hundred thousand monthly listeners, so that means many, many millions of of uh, songs being streamed every month. You know. Yeah, it's it's the system is not working, and and you know if a if an artist can't survive on their art, then they're going to have to do something else. And uh, I I I I'm kind of draw a blank as to how the future will unfold. I mean, I I know that people still love music, and and people are still creative, and you know, there's if you look for it, there's there's um, new artists that are doing good stuff. I mean, there's there's good things being done, you know, combining different musics and and just the the natural human creativity of of telling their stories in their own way. Um, but they're not making a living at it, and uh, it's just it's hard to hard to see a future that. Uh, that uh, you know, all the music that we have is music from the past, because there is no new music because nobody can afford to do music. Well, I know you got something ha happening at the top of the hour, but it's been such a pleasure talking with you, Wayne. Thank you so much. The pleasure is mine. You're a bass player. Um, I'm a singer songwriter. Oh, oh, excellent. I Are you played bass a bit too, cello. I, I mostly tour in Europe uh, these days because I, yeah. I can't pay the bills touring in the U.S. And of course, during the pandemic, I'm just uh, interviewing no, people. Yeah, nobody's me. touring. <laughs> no. People, I, I had uh, I had my um, birthday dinner uh, Saturday night, and uh, Tom Morello I, came. At in Tom's and, place. I heard about that. I was just telling Tom I'm going to be interviewing Wayne, and he said, "Well, that's funny. I just had dinner with him last night." <laughs> And, you know, he had a world tour booked for Rage Against the Machine. I mean. Yeah, I had nine countries booked. It was a really good tour. It was like one of the best tours I had ever booked. Of course, I know so many musicians who had the best tour ever. I mean, it was like the fish that got away, but it was going to be a great tour. I, I, had just, I had just finished doing Australia and New Zealand opening for Alice Cooper. It was great. a great gig to be the opening band on. And he comes in the dressing room and says, what do you think, Wayne? Did you have fun? I said, yeah, this has been great. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's fantastic. He said, you want to do South America? I said, sure, yeah. sign me up. Let's go. And then we came home to masks and Zoom school and everything stopping. I think maybe in 2022, I'll try to go back out again. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm writing a new record now. And uh, if I can get it recorded over the summer and get it released early in 2022, then I can go back out and I'll yeah. have something to talk about. Yeah, 2022. That's that's what I'm thinking is realistic, too. I don't know of anybody that's making serious plans for 2021, but maybe somebody is. I, I, would, I just, I, man, I don't want to be in a crowd of people, you know. I mean, I've heard they're doing it. And, you know, it's like everybody has to have a vaccination and everyone gets their temperature done and uh, but still you know to see a couple thousand people sweaty all up against each other breathing on on me <laughs> I know, it seems scary but china and new zealand everything's back to normal now well they had they had uh, uh, hegemony of, of you know they had an agreement in their culture that we're faced with a medical crisis let's 
deal with it. In this country, we we have bumbled it and fumbled it worse than you could you couldn't have written a worse script than we just went through with Donald Trump at the helm. I mean, he blew it so badly, and then he made it worse by politicizing. Um, you know, health measures. I mean, you get in your car, you put your seatbelt on because that's what we do. It's a cultural norm. You put your mask on because you're outdoors and there's a pandemic. It's a norm, but it no. Should be obvious. Yeah, yeah, right. it should be obvious. But things are so fucked up in this country that that um, well, wearing a helmet while riding a motorcycle ha was also a bit of a political thing, right? Well, For a yeah. while. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a weird concept. Yeah, the right, the right to smash your brains on the floor on the on the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks. how are we doing on time? Oh, we're yeah, out. We better, we're out of time. You better get on to your next thing there. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And, yeah, it really uh, has. Send my best regards to all your your viewers. Will and, do. Uh, wish you Thanks all well, time. and look forward to seeing you all again uh, at some point in the near, not too distant future. Absolutely. In the real world, hopefully. Take yeah. care, Wayne. Power to the fifth estate. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks, everybody, for joining this discussion with Rain, Wayne Kramer, founder of MC5 and Jail Guitar Doors USA, and who uh, once his, whose band once practiced in the same building as the fifth estate offices were in, in Detroit. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll be back uh, tomorrow to interview a uh, historian. And um, take care. Bye for now. Uh, remember, mutual aid will get us through. Don't pay the rent unless you really have to and trust your neighbors.